Welcome, this is Emily Seal here from Motlow College. We'll be working in this textbook, Mastering Public Speaking, uh, the ninth edition. Uh, so today we'll be laying a nice firm foundation for the course by discussing and defining public speaking, the um, benefits, but also I'll admit some of the hardships. We'll talk about communication, kind of in a broad sense, and um, how to communicate effectively in a broad sense. And uh, we'll close up today by talking about the different critical thinking skills that it takes to be a good speaker and how we can encourage those. So uh, this is Seth Godin. He is a marketing expert. and He asks, are we creating and leveraging those tools to regurgitate and spit out more noise or are we, we working to build tools and to help others understand the value of distilling and making sense of the information wave around us? So first of all, he works from the presumption that we all agree that we are in a wave of information. What does that look like? Um, well, if I'm in Walmart and I have my phone in my hand, I might be listening to an audiobook that is in my ear with um, headphones. I might also hear someone over the loudspeaker speaking to me. Uh, Walmart also has these TVs on the end of each aisle now that are kind of, uh, maybe not every aisle, but some aisles, it's kind of talking to you. Uh, and then someone might say something to me in passing, right? That's a lot of information. Um, that's a lot to take in. Not to mention that if I open that phone up, I have the information wage div digitally. I can find out anything, you know, most things that I want to know at the edge of my fingertip. So I'm, we are no longer in a need for information. What we really need now are to build tools, those critical thinking skills, and to be able to understand and distill, to make sense of information. It's not necessarily that we need more information. We need more translators, <laughs> if that makes sense. We need people that can disseminate information to other people to make sense of information. And so it's one of the particular challenges of this generation of students that I haven't seen uh, in years past or when I was a student, uh, I think to the same extent that you as students have you um, you know you're on Facebook you hear uh, all of these news items on Twitter it can be overwhelming the amount of information that's out there and part of my job and part of my main goal for the course is to help you be articulate to help you be discerning and know what information is true what isn't true and then to help you take a stand to empower you to take a stand on any given um, issue or day so when I ask you to take a stand, some of you automatically kind of sit back in your chair and cross your arms and, uh, you know, give me a little harumph, a snort of sorts, because you don't like politics. You like to win friends and influence people, and you don't want to rub people the wrong way. Um, but unfortunately, or fortunately, I think, a big part of my job is as a public educator is to create an informed electorate. I want you to go and vote. I want you um, to uh, be part of a community of people and to help change the world for the better. So um, if you want to get on my bad side, then just tell me uh, I don't care about politics. <laughs> Uh, because I really think that a major goal for this course is for you to start to form your opinions and um, to share them. So even if you're not an opinionated person, um, I still will ask you in this class to take a stand in some way or another. Um, and it's different when you're looking people in the face eye to eye. It can be even more challenging. Um, you know, some some people call it activism, you know, on Twitter, hashtag Black Lives Matter. Uh, but other people might call that slacktivism. If you are just using social media to state your opinions, it can be easier than stating them when you have to make eye contact with someone or risk offending someone in person. Um, so it can be challenging, but I promise I'll, I'll walk you through it and we'll go through these uh, things together. 
um, I, I went to Boston when I was a coach for um, speech and debate and and this um, is very close to uh, my heart this quote I took a picture of it and um, it's really a, a big part of my life mission is to help you speak up they came first for the communists and I did not speak up because I wasn't a communist then they came for the Jews but I didn't speak up because I wasn't a Jew then they came for the trade unionist and I didn't speak up because I wasn't a trade unionist then they came for the Catholics and I didn't speak up because I was a Protestant. Then they came for me. And by that time, no one was left to speak. So there's my husband and my baby. <laughs> uh, that's Elliot there, my little boy. Um, the communication process is admittedly hard. I, I'm not going to tell you that it's easy. Um, it can make or break a relationship. Uh, luckily, I have a very loving and communicative husband. But take, for example, Valentine's Day, right? What I will do on Valentine's Day is I will go to my local Walgreens, to the card aisle, and I will probably spend 30 minutes, maybe even an hour, looking at different Hallmark cards. <laughs> Why do I do that, right? Because I want to communicate to my husband that I appreciate him. Um, you know, but you know, he he's my best friend. He sleeps next to me every night. But I, I when the words try to come out of my mouth, right? I like you. Thanks for liking me too. Like it's just it's difficult. It's difficult to find uh, the words. Um, to sort of share in this communication process. Nietzsche said it very articulately. I'll said, let him say it. That for which we find words is something already dead in our hearts. There's always a kind of contempt in the act of speaking. Uh, so sometimes talk is cheap. I'll say it that way. Sometimes talk is cheap. Um, and sometimes, um, even though we know that communication is important, it it's may be cursed. A lot of world religions, um, you know, believe that communication process is cursed. Um, in the famous tale of the Tower of Babel, right, all of these people are together and then they're cursed to speak different languages, whether that be metaphorical or or actual, right? We don't always speak each other's language and that can be a frustrating process. Okay, if I haven't offended you yet, <laughs> here we go. Um, I would like you to turn over to page four, and we're going to talk about the triangle of meaning. The triangle of meaning. And that is how communication is affected by different people's baggage, right? Different people's baggage. So um, this is, um, you know, the, currently we're, as I record this lecture, um, the Confederate flag, the rebel flag, has been taken down off of South Carolina's Capitol building uh, because it's been deemed offensive. So that's just a little bit of backstory on that. Um, so let's use that to sort of talk about this uh, triangle of meaning. So I'm going to use the analogy of softball. There's a Motlow softball player there. Um, so when I'm trying to communicate with someone, it's kind of like throwing a ball around. I might throw you a hint, whether it be that I actually say, hey you, or I might wave at you. That's another way to communicate. Um, I may just have on a certain pair of shoes and that communicates something to you. Maybe you're a fashionista and you interpret something about my shoes, you know, about who I am. Or maybe you have a hole in my shoe and you interpret something from that as well. Uh, a symbol is anything to which we can attach meaning. So in the analogy, the symbol would be the softball, right? Anything to which we attach meaning. So you may think that if I have on Jimmy Choo shoes that I'm rich and wealthy and that may be a status symbol. I don't. Uh, the interpreter is the person in this situation about the Jimmy Choo shoes, that would be you, the person receiving the message, the one um, who is interpreting any information that's given, whether it be something spoken, something seen, um, 
something acted upon, any symbol on which there is an interpret interpretation. <laughs> and then the referent. <laughs> and this is the part where it gets kind of sticky, right? This is the part where it often goes awry because I have a symbol that I'm trying to send you a message with, but you don't always catch it, right? Have you ever been trying to flirt with someone and they have no idea? <laughs> I love my husband, and uh, but he can be a little bit dense, right, when it came to flirting with him and trying to show um, interest in him. Uh, it went right over his head. Bless it. Um, <laughs> so how we uh, interpret or take on the symbols is where it often goes awry. This referent issue, um, trying to speak the same language. That's really where we find the rub. So back to the rebel flag. I know I kind of tabled that. Um, some people see the Confederate flag as a piece of history, right? Um, and, and that's what it means to them. Kanye said the rebel flag to me means slavery, and I think we need to talk about slavery more. So Kanye decided to um, use the rebel flag as his flag and uh, very controversially so. Uh, of course, we know that some people see the rebel flag as a status of white supremacy. I see the rebel flag as um, association with my high school because uh, we were the rebels. That was our little mascot there. He was a rebel. I went to Franklin County High School in Winchester, Tennessee. And so that's what I think of when I see a rebel flag. Um, you know, some of the people uh, from my high school who wore the rebel flag, it may have been out of school spirit, or it could have meant to them a hunting and fishing lifestyle, an outdoorsy southern lifestyle. Some of us, uh, when we see a rebel flag, we start uh, playing free bird in our head or sweet home Alabama. It may just be a cultural marker of southern identity. But this is just one example about how a symbol, any given symbol, can be interpreted and misinterpreted in any given circumstance. People create meanings, right? So the dictionary is a fluid and ever-changing thing. Words um, fall in and out of favor. Words um, mean different things to different people and different cultures, right? When I went to Germany and I said, Ich bin heiß, I meant to say I am hot. They took that to mean I am sexually warm, <laughs> right? I, as a 15-year-old, did not mean in any way to say that I was sexually warm, right? This is a, a comically bad misinterpretation. So what can we do? We can be careful about our words. You must try to ensure that the message your audience hears matches as closely as possible to the message you intend as closely. Now we'll talk about connotations um, later on in the book, but a connotation is just an emotional association with a word, an emotional association with any given word. Now what can happen and what may have already happened in this lecture is if someone gets genuinely offended by you, they stop listening. If someone gets genuinely offended, they're no longer open. Their body language is likely to close. Maybe they cross their arms or stare out the window or just a shift, right? A shift in focus. They're tuning you out. And that's the worst thing that can happen, right? Because we're no longer having a conversation. There's no longer any communication happening if nobody's catching the ball if the ball's going over their head, if they refuse to catch the ball. That's one of the tricky things about listening. You have to have ears to hear. If you don't have ears to hear, we're not going to have a communication process. So what I would recommend to you is choose your words wisely. Choose your words wisely. Go to the library, open a dictionary, find a thesaurus. Um, a couple years ago, I uh, went to my first graduation. I was very excited. I had my regalia, my cap, my gown. Uh, I was waving at different people who were graduating. Uh, the graduation speaker, however, um, it didn't, wasn't really into the pulse of the modern 
age and she gave a speech about winning well this was at the time that Charlie Sheen announced himself a winner and that he was winning uh, because he was doing uh, drugs and sleeping with prostitutes and so she had no idea that that word winning had a cultural context around it at that moment and there were more than one little snicker in the audience as she kept talking about Motlow graduates being winners so um, choose your words wisely it doesn't always mean necessarily uh, that you have to be super super book smart although I think that being intentional about our vocabulary helps you to be articulate but it also might be might mean being street smart knowing what's going on in the culture and how to use your words effectively in a way that uh, people have good connotations with so you're not 100% responsible for what someone else hears. You can't necessarily help what's going on in someone else's head, but you can be careful. You can know that you're stepping into a minefield and be careful. So, if I haven't already communicated this, when when someone is sitting in the audience and you're up there speaking, it is partially your responsibility to make sure that they're listening right I always ask myself am I teaching or am I talking because if I'm teaching then people are paying attention people are learning but sometimes I'm just talking right so one of the major goals for the course is for you to start to learn about yourself if you haven't already um, as Shakespeare would say know thyself what um, are your strengths what are your weaknesses? That's something you may be asked in a, a business interview. Please don't tell them that your weakness is that you're a perfectionist, uh, unless that's actually true. That's sort of a, a trope, a, a simplistic answer that people say just to, um, you know, sound perfect. Uh, but really, you need to know, and, and your, your employees and your employers need to know, what are you good at? And, and where might you um, need improvement? And if you work with your employers, with your leaders, um, they can help you with, with your teachers, right? We can help you with your weaknesses. Um, so here's the trick. And I'm going to ask you to do a little self-evaluating in this moment. Are you the kind of person who makes a plan and has to stick to the plan? Or are you a more flexible person? Because here's what I'm asking you. And here's what, what the inference is if you haven't caught it already. If you have a planned speech, you plan to speak and you planned uh, to say it a certain way and you've practiced it in front of other people and you're, it's coming out of your mouth but you see that people aren't understanding. Maybe they're sleeping, maybe they're confused, but for whatever reason they're not catching the ball that you're throwing. So here's the challenge for some of you who are very type A. Maybe you're, you're a little, you know, you're conscientious, which is good in some ways, but you may need to let go a little bit. Relax, let it go, let it go, right? And change the plan. Maybe you need to throw in a joke. Maybe you need to wake up the audience somehow. Um, maybe you need to change your tone. You need to be flexible when you're in front of an audience because that's how we get from talking to teaching, right? How we really truly connect with our audience. One of the ways that you can do this, uh, that you can be flexible, is here. here's a teacher um, and she, uh, if she sees that her audience isn't paying attention, she can close proximity with them. Now this is one of the advantages to being in a public speaking situation. So if you're on page six, you can see that there are different levels of communication. There's intra, which is within yourself and your mind, and we'll talk about that uh, when we talk about self-talk. Interpersonal, when it's just you and one other person, maybe a colleague, maybe a lover. Uh, a group communication, right? Uh, and public communication. So. Group communication is when we're having a discussion, but public communication, of course, uh, is one person disseminating information to everybody else. And then we have mass communication. So what I'm doing right now is a recorded video. 
that is mass communication. What she's doing here is they're, um, they are uh, learning about an Arabic culture through a translator over a video uh, chat, which is pretty interesting. So they're having a discussion even though they are um, far, far away from each other, which is pretty cool. Uh, now they can look at each other and they can make facial expressions and share. Uh, and one of the cool things about our public communication process is that you're in the room with people. And so you can do what's called the quadrant method, uh, which means that you can look at different areas in the room. And of course, in, in education where I learned this method uh, in teaching, they call it quadrant because you would divide the room into four different areas. So some people like to sit in the back of a classroom because they think that a teacher won't pick on them if they're sitting in the back. Uh, well, not in my class. <laughs> uh, I will walk all the way to the back of the classroom just to pick on you, uh, just to get you involved, just to have a closer conversation with you. Because often, um, you know, I'll catch someone texting or I will um, have to ask someone not to talk to their neighbor. It's sometimes the people on the back row right who have intentionally um, sat all the way back there and what I've learned and what you may have learned some of you who have teaching or um, experience in these areas is that if you close proximity if you get closer to someone they usually stop the inappropriate behavior so if you're trying to give a speech and someone on the back row is snickering, I would challenge you just to take a few steps into the audience. There's nothing that says you have to stand behind the podium in our public communication process. Now, obviously, when the president stands and has to give a speech uh, to Congress, then, uh, then he or she has to stand behind a podium, right? There's no... Um, there's no informality there but we as a classroom are fairly small so feel free to engage come into our space um, another thing that I would say when it comes to public communication is energy matching so with your audience you have to kind of feel the way this is one of the the traps of mass communication as I'm giving this speech to you over uh, a media source I can't tell were you offended by my talk about the Confederate flag? Were you offended? Uh, maybe you're offended by her hijab. I don't know. I don't know what offends you. Um, and if I'm in a room, I can kind of feel it out and rush through things that might be offensive or tone down my tone if, if I'm coming across too harsh. But without that feedback, I'm really kind of going blind, right? But the advantage of having a live audience in front of you is you can energy match. And this is something instinctual that we do. When we're talking to a small child, we get down, we talk in a more high-pitched voice, right? Um, when we're talking to our elders, maybe we get into a more respectful uh, tone and that is a good and normal process for you to do. Um, so uh, feel out the room is what I'm saying. Keep your eyes open. Pay attention. If people, um, but I specifically mean by energy, is if you walk into the room and it's an 8 a.m. class and everybody's half asleep, if you walk in like a cheerleader and say, let's get this speech going, woohoo, yeah, right? <laughs> they are probably going to tune out even more, right? You're going to have to, you're going to have to warm them up. You're going to have to kind of boost their energy slowly rather than shouting at them. Because if you shout at them, what's going to happen? They're going to cross their arms. They're going to lean back. They're going to tune out. And the goal is to help them listen, to help them keep going on our journey. There's Elliot, my sweet little boy. Uh, feedback, right? So feedback is anything, any information, verbal or nonverbal, uh, in, in the form of a response between communicators. So obviously my little four month here, he really depends heavily on his body language. He has not yet developed, but he is very expressive, I must say. We can all see from this picture, he does not like tummy time. He is clear with me that he does not like his tummy time. He does not like to lay on his tummy and practice crawling or, you know, working towards crawling. He is not a fan right so you need to watch for feedback it can be a laugh it can be a snicker right uh, it can be something positive it can be something negative but you need to watch the people around you and clue into those verbal and nonverbal um, 
experiences that are going on in your room. Now, if you're somebody who has um, a disability or maybe um, you have a condition like Asperger's or autism, then I understand that feedback is something that's a little more difficult for you. And we can talk about that individually. Um, hopefully you've had some private coaching and you've come as far as you have and achieved as much as you have in order to get to college by um, having some solid coping me mechanisms in place. Okay, so on the syllabus, I had that big old word in the middle there, extemporaneous. That's how you are to speak in my class. That is extemporaneously. And that is because of the importance of feedback. So on uh, your left here, you can see impromptu. That means that you're coming up with it right off the top of your head. Uh, which means you're going to say um a lot more, right? Because you're trying to think of what you're going to say next. You haven't prepared enough. On the far right here, we have declamation, and that is just reading. I don't want you to do that. You see how he's turned with his back to the audience. He's looking at the screen, and he's reading from the screen. Uh, these meetings infuriate me uh, because I can read. <sighs> Uh, anybody can read the the PowerPoint slide. We don't need you to come read it for us. That's not giving a speech. That declamatorily uh, reciting or reading a speech is is too formal, especially for a small group. Now it might be different if it was a larger group or a different setting. There's a time and a place, right? Um, I might choose at a funeral to speak declamatorily. Maybe I want to, uh, depending on the formality of a certain kind of worship service, I might need to read that speech, that eulogy, um, because of the style uh, in which uh, the opportunity presents itself. But for the purposes of our class, I want you to speak extempore. I want you to be that green zone in the middle. Now, this is a continuum, which means that some of you will be a little more impromptu. You'll be a little more spontaneous by nature. Some of you will be a little more declamatory. And there is a wide continuum uh, based on your personality of what kind of speaking style you have, and also based on the room. Maybe you planned for things to go one way, and uh, you end up walking into the room and everybody's really quiet and still and you need to shake it up a little. Or maybe you walk into the room and it's really rowdy and you need to tone it down some, right? Depending on the feedback you're hearing, you speak extempore. So let's define extemporaneously in no uncertain terms. It needs to be previously planned. If it's impromptu, it's not planned at all. But extempore, we have planned what we're going to say. We've created an outline which we'll talk about in a different chapter. And then secondly, we will deliver with the help of only a few, if any, notes. For most of you, your notes will be the PowerPoint. You can see on the syllabus that you get two note cards for most speeches. Um, I do not want you to write word for word everything on your speech because that would make it a declamation. This is extempore. But maybe you have a quote that you want to make sure you say word for word. Maybe you realize you're having trouble remembering exactly what year. That would be a time to put it on a note card. But remember, you can, um, all of my speeches, you are allowed to use PowerPoint or some sort of presentation media. So if you have trouble with memory, I would encourage you to uh, use the PowerPoint. And lastly, like we've been talking about, you need to adapt to the audience, right? So an extemporaneous speech is previously planned. It's delivered with uh, the help of a few or no notes, and it's adapted to your audience. You're making eye contact when you're reading the room, and you're changing your speech according to their needs. So what gets in the way? What gets in the way of a speech? In our analogy that we had of a softball player and a ball and um, your uh, interpreters, your catcher, uh, the noise might be a pitcher. I mean, a, a, a someone hitting the ball in between, right? Somebody knocking it out of the way. It keeps your message, something that's intentionally um, getting between your message and your hearer or unintentionally. So sometimes the noise is physical. You may have heard on the background of this lecture they're doing construction out on the street and you may have heard a little bit of that. If my dogs uh, see something or my baby starts crying and my dogs start barking the baby starts crying, that would be physical noise in the space that I'm in now. 
physiological noises within your own body. Some of you might be hungry and so you're distracted because you're too busy thinking about your next meal. Um, you, maybe you have a backache. Uh, maybe um, you're hot in the room. Some school teachers think it's a good idea to like turn the air up really high so that students are awake and paying attention. But the reason I don't endorse any sort of um, craftiness with a, th a thermostat if you're an educator is because really it can be distracting. The, the ideal audience is comfortable. They're not sitting in a cold room. They're not sitting in a hot room. Um, you know, some it's been theorized, okay, well, if the room is a little bit colder, you may not know this, but your body temperature actually drops before you fall asleep. And so if the room is a little bit colder, people are more likely to go to sleep. Uh, so then people turn up the th thermostat. But once again, um, the fewer distractions, the better. We don't want to have noise. We don't want to have anything getting between a message and our uh, interpreter. The last one is psychological noise. People are thinking about a conversation, a fight they had with their uh, significant other. Maybe they have psychological noise because they're worried about giving the speech next. And they have that anxiety, which is having, they're having trouble focusing. Uh, it tends to be personal problems, right? So all of these are distractions from listening. All right, lastly, uh, as promised, we're getting over to page 10. Um, did I put page 8 on the last? No, I did put 9. Okay, good. Um, looking at critical thinking skills critical thinking skills. So uh, giving a speech is a complex thing. If you haven't already gotten that from today's lecture, I'll say it outright. It's a complicated thing. You have to be able to focus. You have to be able to remember everything that uh, you've studied and retrieve it, maybe on a moment's notice in an impromptu way or in an extemporary way. You have to gather information, right? You have to collect all of that data. Um, you have to organize it in a way that is meaningful and can be understood by the audience. Uh, you have to analyze it and um, examine how something relates to something else. Some of you are just maybe not that um, imaginative and generating topics. I have people who come to my office and sit and say, I just can't think of anything to talk about for this next speech. And we work together to try to find something relevant and meaningful for them. Um, integrating, right? Uh, one thing that can be really challenging is a lecture, even for me today, of summarizing. Right? Integrating has a lot to do with restructuring, combining, summarizing. A lot of your speeches are very short, which can be even more challenging than talking for an hour, talking for 10 minutes. It's really difficult to um, distill information and simplify it. Uh, that's one of the challenges of Twitter, right? 140 characters. You have to boil it down to something simplistic. And then um, lastly, and this is the skill that some of you uh, really just have a knee-jerk ge reaction against, which is evaluating. Sometimes we have to judge. This is good. That is bad right? Or maybe it's in a gray area. But those sort of qualitative statements, some of you, they are not a problem for you. But other things I've noticed, especially about this generation, you have, um, you, you have sort of a resistance to that. But it's part of my responsibility as an educator is to ask you to start to make qualitative statements about uh, your convictions that you hold. So, uh, all of these are skills and just like you might go to the gym and lift weights we, we're asking you to exercise your mind so please don't embrace a defeatist attitude this is a time for you to start to reflect on who you are and what your strengths and weaknesses are and once you or identify that weakness you got to work on it right I'm still working on these skills particularly number four just to be honest 
you'll see me at the beginning of class. Uh, heads up, another thing I really am bad at is please don't come see me at the beginning of class because usually I'm rushing around trying to get organized before the class begins. Um, but I know this about myself, so I carry a day planner with me. I um, I set timers and reminders for myself uh, because I'm, you know, I need to stay organized. So. If you come to my office you'll see it's usually a wreck <laughs> but I am intentional about overcoming my weaknesses so um, I hope that uh, we've laid a strong groundwork for you in the course I hope that you've learned a little bit about uh, feedback and how important it is to listen while you're speaking I want you to be people who not only talk you also teach Thank you for listening.